Today I will be going over descriptive stats and inferential stats. Let's start with descriptive stats. Descriptive stats are numbers that summarize data. So after you do research, you're collecting data, be it a experiment, be it a correlational study, and I have all these numbers and all this data, and now you have to summarize it. The process of summarizing that data is what we call descriptive stats. Again, just putting it into what we call the range, standard deviation, mean, medium, mode, uh, what have you. A phrase that will pop up a number of times throughout the year are measures of central tendency. And there are actually three measures of central tendency. And there's actually a previous AP test question that simply had you list on the free response, list the three measures of central tendency. And that was just one point. And what these three measures do is they describe the typical value in a data set. Again, describe the typical value in a data set. And the three of them are mean, median, and mode. Those three, which you probably are aware of, any kind of background in any kind of math or stat class, most people know mean, median, mode. In psychology, we refer to those as the three measures of central tendency. So now we've described the stats, we've put them out numerically here, and now the three numbers, mean, median, mode, are showing us the typical values in that data set. So let's start with the first one here, mode. Mode is the value that occurs most often. Again, mode is the value that occurs most often. And I have a couple examples for you here. Uh, here's basically three data sets here. And when you get a data set, you want to put them numerically in order first and foremost. And the very first data set up here, there are four numbers, three, four, four, five. Because there are, there's only one three, there's only one five, and there's two fours, then four would be the mode of that data set. If you look here, three, four, five, and six, no number is any more than the other. So actually here we'd say no mode. There is no mode at all. You can have that. And then our third data set here, you have three, four, four, five, five. Well, four is twice, five is two times. So this would be called bimodal, bimodal, meaning two modes. So you'd have four as a mode and you'd have five as a mode. You can go above and beyond that, but in psychology, we really stop at here. Here's the first mode, the one mode, if you will. Then we have no mode, and then what we could have a bimodal here with the four and the five. So that's mode, the value that occurs most often. Then you have the median. The median, think about the, the road. In the middle of the road is the median. And so if you ever get confused between median and the next one, mean, always think median, middle of the road is the median. Well, here, it's the middle number or the halfway point in the data set. So it's the middle number or the halfway point in a data set. So here are two examples here. And if you had three, four, and five, four here is your middle number, that's the median. But in a data set, you'll also often have even numbers here, three, four, five, and six. There are four numbers here. There's no middle one here. So you take the two middle ones, add them together, that's nine, divide by two, therefore your median is 4.5. And then the third measure of central tendency is the mean, and the mean is also known as the average. Okay? And so using the same data sets up here, in this one, the mean, the, mean, the average is going to be 4, and for this one, it's going to be 4.5. So a lot of cases, the mean and the median are the same, um, even the mode. Technically, could be, all three could be the same, or two of the three, whatever. But in this case here, it's also 4, and it's also 4.5 as it was here. And so that would be mean, median, and mode, the three measures of central tendency. When we're talking about numbers some more, we have a term called variability. How do the scores vary amongst each other? Well, the first one here, and an easy one here, is the range. The range is the difference between the highest and the lowest score. So as a teacher, I often look, yes, at the average. I want to know the mean, but I also look at the range and say, okay, here's a chapter test, and if someone gets a perfect and someone gets a 52%, that's a range of 48, and that would be some number I would look at. And then it'd be chapter two. People get perfect, but now the lowest is a 68. Well, the range is getting shorter and smaller, and that's a good thing, in my opinion, as a teacher. A term you may have heard of and maybe scare some of you is standard deviation. It can be simplified or signified as SD here. Now, in psychology, we don't have to technically calculate it, you know, by their, its formula. But you need, to underst you need to understand what the formula looks like and what it means about the standard deviation here. If you were to conduct the formula here, here's kind of what it means. The standard deviation is related to the difference between each score and the mean. So it's related to the difference 
between each score and a mean. So actually what you would do is you take your data set and you got all your numbers and you got your average and you look at the average and compare it to each and every score in the data set. And that's kind of how you calculate the formula. But we don't need to calculate that big formula. We need to know kind of what's going on here, about what you're doing, average compared to the scores. But the easy part here is the greater the range, the greater the standard deviation. So again, if I have a chapter one exam where someone got 100 and a person got 52, that's a range of 48. Next test, someone gets 100, someone only gets 75. It's a range of 25. I know that second data set has a smaller standard deviation. So the greater the range, the greater the standard deviation. But even another one here is the greater the standard deviation, the more variability, meaning the scores are varying more and you don't always want that. And so think of like a test score. And at the end of the semester one, you've taken 11 chapter exams. And let's say you're sitting here and your parents are going, well, how consistent were you throughout the year? And you say, well, I got an average of 80%. Well, that just tells you the average. That doesn't tell you your, your consistency. It doesn't tell you your variability. Because what may have happened is you have one student who maybe gets one test as an 82, and then a 78, 81, 79, and a couple 80s, then an 85 and a 75. They're bouncing back between you know, plus or minus 80. They're pretty consistent. It's going to have a lower standard deviation. But you get the other student who, again, still has an average of 80% in the tests, but they're inconsistent. One test was a 90, then you had a 70. And then you got an 80, and you had an 85, and a 75, and then back to your 90 and 70 or whatever, but you're bouncing all over. You're not a consistent test taker, and that would tell you something about maybe preparation or what you're doing for every test. And so that would be standard deviation. Now, correlations. Okay, we, in the past, we did talk about correlational studies, but now let's talk about a correlational coefficient, and that coefficient can be signified by this little r, correlational coefficient. What that little r tells you is the strength and the direction, okay? You have the strength and then you have the direction of your correlation. And what you're going to find out here is your correlational coefficient can only, between, only be between plus 1.0 to negative 1.0. It cannot be outside that range. So any quiz test question you ever see on my test or the AP exam, they give you like a plus 3.5, negative 2.9. Don't even look at those because they cannot be the correlational coefficient. It can only be between plus 1.0 and negative 1.0. The plus there simply tells you it's a positive correlation. Okay, that it's meaning the two variables are going in the same direction. They may be increasing together or they may be decreasing together. And what this signifies here, if you had to graph it, this is kind of how the graph would look, meaning starting the bottom left and working its way up to the top right. That direction would be a positive correlation and sometimes they ask you to sh basically just identify that on a test. With the minus sign, that means it's a negative correlation, meaning the two variables are going the opposite direction. One is going up, one is going down. And again on the graph here, starting maybe top left, working your way down to the bottom right, that would be then a negative correlation. So you got positive correlation, negative correlation. If you have a zero, that means no correlation at all. There is no correlation. Now, what you're going to find, the question I would give you here, is basically asked you to identify the strongest correlation. Well, the closer to plus one and negative one are the strongest correlations. So the closest to the ends of the spectrum, plus 1.0 to negative 1.0, that is the, again, strongest correlation. Closer to zero here in the middle is the weakest. So again, on that quiz question, I can give you and say which is the strongest correlation and I can give you outside of that range, don't even look at them. But even better yet, I could say, okay, how about plus 0.89, again, plus 0.89 versus negative 0 0.90, which is stronger. Well, people get tricked up by the negative, but don't get tricked up by the negative. The negative 0 0.90 is closer to the end of the spectrum, therefore it is the stronger correlation. And a term you may come across is illusory correlation. Think about it, an illusion, optical illusion, that it's basically you think a correlation exists, but one does not. Okay, so it's an illusion. And I think a lot of times it's superstitions. People are superstitious. I have to wear this shirt. I have to use this pen for this test. Or if you're any kind of any ac extracurricular activity, be it ac or ac uh, athletic or not, doesn't matter. You know, I got to wear these socks. I got to wear this shirt. I got to do this. 
they think means you're going to do well. And that's just a superstition. There probably isn't a correlation. But even stereotypes. A lot of people think, well, you're this color, you're this ethnicity, you live here, you do this. That means automatically this about you. It's a good correlation. No, it's not. And so a lot of your stereotypes and superstitions are examples of illusory correlations. Last slide here in last two terms, we have inferential stats. Okay, whereas descriptive stats at the beginning were numbers that summarize the data. Now you have inferential stats. Here, you already have the results. The results are now compiled. You have your range and standard deviation, mean, median, mode, or whatever. Well, now you have to infer. What did the what does the data really mean? Because descriptive stats just tell you what it is. Now what does it mean? For example, let's say I have a a new AP test prep program. And this year I have to pilot it to figure out what am I going to buy next year for the students. Well, let's say program A, after a whole year of working on it, their average is 80.3 on tests. And then you got program B, the average is a 79.6. Now, you may be quick to jump, oh, the 80.3 is a much better program than 79.6, but statistically, that's pretty close. That's not that far off. Well, now I got to really start to infer and to think about which program is better. Is one more time consuming? Is one cheaper? One, I mean, all these different variables that you have to infer and think about it. And the last term is statistically significant. Statistically significant here. And I'm going to add a term here. Correlation slash results is or are not by chance, basically what you say. Let me phrase that again here. If you say the results or the correlation is statistically significant, then that correlation or those results did not come by chance. And so you are very confident about these results. Because you might do a study where you say, no, the correlational coefficient is not, or sorry, the correlation or the results is not statistically significant. Well, that means that the results may have come by chance. There may be a third factor out there that you're not aware of yet that are affecting the results. And for this chapter here, chapter two, I think that's a pretty good summary of stats and how we're going to use them here in research. But later when we talk about intelligence and testing, we'll come back to stats in a much more in-depth way and expand upon it and review a lot of it.